Today on Let the Bible Speak. It's important that we are saved, but does it make any difference how we're saved? Good day and welcome. It's a privilege to study the Word of God with you for a few moments today, and I appreciate you for joining me. Are you saved? If so, how were you saved? Were you saved in a way that is different than how other people were saved? Does it make any difference, so long as we believe we have been saved? We began a series of lessons last week posing the question, does it make any difference? And in our last study together, we asked, does it make any difference what I believe? Today we want to turn our attention to that same question, but regarding salvation. The Word of God not only defines salvation, it tells us how it is received and gives us examples of how people did receive it during the time the apostles were alive and fulfilling Christ's great commission to go and preach the good news of salvation through Him. In Acts the 16th chapter, we have one such account, and it involved a sinful jailer and two preachers who were being held in that jail. Paul and Silas were confined in this Philippian prison and were singing and praying at the midnight hour when an extraordinary series of events occurred leading to the salvation of that jailer. There was that midnight earthquake that was so powerful it jarred open the doors of the prison and caused the chains holding the prisoners to come loose. The jailer awakened out of his slumber and thinking the prisoners were freed, he almost killed himself until Paul cried out that they were all still there. Well, as you may recall, the jailer was so overcome by the turn of events that verses 29 and 30 say, Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a very important question. Here we have a man who wanted to be saved from his sins. He inquired of Paul and Silas what he had to do to receive Christ's salvation. They told him what he needed to do. And within the hour, the jailer and even his family had submitted to God's plan of salvation. We read of other such encounters throughout the book of Acts. The circumstances were varied, but the message was the same, and the obedience rendered by those being saved was the same as well. If that that is the case, doesn't that tell us that it makes a difference how we are saved? That will be the proposition for our study today. Does it make a difference how I'm saved? After a song. All around me every moment is the wondrous love of God Filling my soul, keeping me whole And in Christ the path to glory showing where the Master trod I am foreshadowed by love by God's wondrous, His marvelous love Some time ago I was talking with a man about salvation. We were discussing baptism and whether baptism is necessary for a person to be saved. Very soon into the conversation he simply asked, well does it really make any difference? 
He was asking what difference does it make whether a person was baptized or said a prayer or had some other kind of experience as long as they are saved, as long as they've come to Jesus, implying that one can be saved in any number of different ways. Well, that's the way many people think today. And while we may agree that faith in Christ is the only means of salvation, many believe that there are many ways to express that faith, and therefore how one person is saved may differ from how another person is saved. For example, some claim they were saved when they simply believed in their heart, the instant that they came to understand and believe that Jesus Christ was divine or that He was the Savior and they wanted Him to save them. Some say that they received salvation when they cried out to Christ and asked Him to come into their heart and save them, or in the form of maybe a more formal prayer, they invited Jesus to become their Savior. Some claim other types of experiences as the moment they received salvation. And others believe that salvation occurs when one, in faith, obeys the conditions of the gospel, including being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Does it make a difference as long as we claim to believe in Jesus? Well, I propose that it does indeed matter. Not only does it matter in whom we believe, it matters what we believe about what that person has said. I believe it matters for several reasons that we will present in our lesson today. But I want to begin by pointing out that there is a difference between the circumstances that may lead us to Christ and then on the other hand the way we enter into Christ. There's a difference between the events that may lead one to learn the truth and want to be saved and the things, on the other hand, that every person must do in order to be saved. Salvation does not just fall from heaven upon people. Salvation is not some uh, better felt than told experience that overwhelms and overcomes a person's will. Salvation is a deliberate thing. Salvation happens when one responds to the hearing of the gospel of Christ, and that gospel is the same for everyone who is saved. For example, a person may be raised in a Christian home, trained by Christian parents, and he or she comes to faith in Christ at an early age through those circumstances. Another person may experience some great sorrow or tragedy later in life, and that may prompt them to start seeking God, and they may come to faith in Jesus Christ. Still another person may travel a very different path in life that ultimately leads them to the cross to encounter the gospel. But you see, in all three cases, regardless of the path that brought them to that point of hearing the gospel, the fact is they all three must hear, believe, and obey the gospel in order to be saved. And that plan is for everyone. First of all, it makes a difference how I'm saved because the Bible plainly shows us what people in the first century did in order to be saved. The apostles of our Lord were directly commissioned to take the gospel to the whole world, Jew and ultimately Gentile. They were given the Holy Spirit to guide them and lead them and empower them in that work and in that process. Now notice what Jesus says in giving that commission in Mark chapter 16, beginning of verse 15. He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned." Now notice that Jesus not only specified what the apostles were to preach to every person on earth, the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, but He also mentions the response that every person should have to that preaching. He says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now this agrees with Matthew's account of the Great Commission given in Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 where Jesus told them to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, you know, most people today assume that baptism is nothing more than a church ordinance for new Christians. But notice that's not where Jesus placed the act of baptism. Notice carefully that Jesus said first to make disciples, baptizing them. And then he says, teaching them, who? Those they have baptized. Teaching them to observe the things of the Christian life, the things that Christ had commanded. Now then, if we begin in Acts chapter 2 and we progress through the book of Acts, which is Luke's record of the apostles carrying out that commission that Christ gave, we will find that very order of events taking place time and time again. We'll find where the apostles went and preached, where people believed the teaching of the apostles and submitted to it in baptism, 
And then the apostles uh, made sure that those people were grounded in the faith and learned to live the Christian life. But baptism came at the beginning. Baptism came before they were trained in the things of the Christian life. So baptism is not a church ordinance or a deed that some Christian performs somewhere along the way in his Christian journey. Baptism is the portal at which one through faith in Christ enters into Christ and into the kingdom of God. Now when Peter preached to the multitude on the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church of Christ, they asked him and the other apostles in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now Peter didn't rebuke them for asking that question. He answered that question. Verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, that word means forgiveness, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now look down at verse 41, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now you see there was no baptism Sunday scheduled weeks later or months later. They were baptized at the very time they first heard and believed the gospel, and they were not part of the church until they had been baptized. The Lord added to the church people who had been baptized, not the other way around. Now other preachers can say what they will, but friend, that's exactly what your Bible says. You can read it in, what, in, in your very own Bible. Then you turn to Acts chapter 8 where Philip goes and preaches to the city of Samaria. And verse 12 tells us that they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, that they both men and women were baptized. And then you go down about 15 verses and you'll find Philip being dispatched to a desert road to intercept a traveler who was reading the scriptures and wanted to know what they meant. He was seeking, he was searching. He was an official from Ethiopia. And so Philip went and he found him, and according to verse 35, he preached Jesus to him. Well, what does that mean, that he preached Jesus? Well, obviously it meant the person and the work of Christ, telling him who Jesus was and is, and what Christ had done. But you see, it must have included something else as well, because the very next verse, verse 36 says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now how would he have known to ask such a question had Philip not told him that that was what he must do as he preached Jesus to him? And the text goes on to describe how that they stopped right there on the side of the road he was baptized. Then you turn the page to Acts chapter 9, and Saul of Tarsus meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And now convinced in that experience that Jesus was the Son of God, he wanted to know what the Lord wanted him to do. He asked the Lord, what would he have him to do? And Christ told him to go into the city and wait for his servant Ananias to come to him, and Ananias would tell him what he must do. And so Ananias goes and restores Saul's sight, and verse 18 tells us, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. It wasn't something that took place later. He was baptized then. One more in Acts chapter 16. Uh, Paul and Silas were held in that Philippian jail as we read at the beginning of the program. And through that extraordinary circumstance they became convinced that what Paul and Silas had been preaching was true. And verses 30 through 33 say, And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now somebody says, Well, see there, here this man was just told to believe on Jesus Christ, and he would be saved. So he was saved in a different way than the people maybe on the day of Pentecost. Oh no, because read the very next statement. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. You see, belief included more than just mentally assenting in his mind. There was more to speak to him and to his house. And the Bible says that as the result of whatever they spoke to him, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Well, there's repentance, Acts 2.38. And immediately he and all his family were baptized, Acts 2.38, you see. And we could continue. Time and time and time again, the apostles and those operating under their authority encountered sinners, preached Christ to them, and those who believed turned away from their sins and were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Baptism always happened immediately at the time that that person came to believe that Jesus Christ was who he, was, who he claimed to be. Now, does it make any difference whether we do the same? 
friend, you'll never find a single example of people being told to simply invite Christ into their hearts or to whisper a prayer asking Christ to save them. There is no such passage in the New Covenant. You will never find a single example of salvation occurring in any other way once Christ went back to heaven and the New Covenant went into effect than people hearing and believing the gospel that the apostles revealed and immediately being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. That is a far cry from what people are being told today. The only sinner's prayer you'll read about after the death and resurrection of Jesus and His return to heaven is the appeal a sinner makes to God in baptism. Why are you waiting, Ananias asked Saul in Acts 22 verse 16. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. That's where and that's when and that's how you call on the name of the Lord. And there is no other way under the new covenant for one to call on the name of the Lord besides doing what Saul and all the others we have learned about and others recorded in the book of Acts, those who came into the church, what they did. And that is by being baptized. See, you see, it makes a difference how I'm saved because there's only one way of salvation described in the New Covenant, that is Christ, and Christ only has one way to receive the forgiveness that He procured and offered, and that is shown consistently again and again. And I know that people try to point to the thief on the cross who cried out to Jesus in His dying moments, but friend, the New Covenant had not yet gone into effect, and Christ had not yet given His apostles the Great Commission. He had not yet returned to heaven when He saved that thief. And if you'd like to study more about that, you can find sermons on our website or on our YouTube channel that deal with the thief on the cross and his salvation, and I encourage you to do that. Number two, it makes a difference how I'm saved because each step of obedience that Christ commanded is within itself significant and in relation to all the others. You see, when one is saved, there is not only a transaction that takes place in the mind of God, at the same time, there is a transition and the beginning of a transformation that takes place in the heart of the sinner. And that process does not occur if the gospel is not obeyed in each respect. For example, you know, before one is saved, he doesn't trust God nor Christ. In fact, he may not even know who Christ is, much less believe in Him and submit to Him. However, that's where the preaching of the gospel comes in. When that person, through whatever means, on whatever occasion, through whatever medium, when he hears the gospel, well, he becomes aware of his need for Christ. A person, therefore, cannot be saved unless at some point he or she hears the gospel. Hearing the gospel is necessary, and hearing the gospel changes that person's understanding. The hearing of the word then leads to faith. If that word preached falls upon an open and receiving heart, well, that person believes what they hear. Their mind is then changed. Their thinking is changed. This change of understanding and mind then convicts them of their sinful life and the need to change direction. So placing their faith in Jesus, that decision leads them to repentance. And that marks a change in the person's will. When they then decide to turn away from sin and turn to Christ, this means submitting to Christ as Lord and King. They then confess Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God. That's not just a verbal formality, but that confession of Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God indicates a change of allegiance, you see, a recognition of Jesus as God's anointed one. It's a change of allegiance. But what does baptism mean? Well, Paul said in Galatians 3 and verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's so very plain, my friend. Baptism, you see, constitutes a change of state. We move from being outside of Christ to being inside of Christ is what Paul tells us. When? When we are baptized into Christ. Now, friend, all of that must take place to say that a person has been converted. All of that must take place for a person to be saved. I didn't determine that. God determined that, and He revealed it in His Word. There's nothing complicated about that. There's nothing hard to perform about that. That's simply the straightforward will of Jesus Christ concerning the salvation of men and women, and He's revealed it in His Word. And as we learned last week, it makes a difference what we believe about what God has said, simply because God has said it, if for no other reason. If it makes a difference what we believe about salvation, 
it also makes a difference what we do concerning salvation, you see. And correspondingly, it makes a difference how I'm saved because Christ is the author of salvation. Now look over at Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in the 8th verse. Though he, speaking of Christ, were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now the term author essentially means provider. Salvation, in other words, comes from God through Jesus Christ, through His plan, not our plan, not our means. Salvation is extended to us by the grace of God manifest in the work of Christ upon the cross. But that salvation is obtained, he says, conditionally. That salvation is obtained by all who obey Him or all who submit themselves to Him. Now, if He's the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey Him, is He at the same time the author or provider of salvation to all those who do not obey Him, those who refuse to obey Him, those who reject His command to be baptized? Friend, salvation is not something we initiate. God initiated salvation. He offers salvation to us on His terms, not ours. And in fact, we need to understand that salvation or pardon from our sins must first take place in the mind of God. I fear that many don't understand that. Salvation first takes place in the mind of God. Pardon takes place in the mind of God. In other words, God does not consider us saved because we consider ourselves saved. We're not forgiven because we think we're forgiven or we feel forgiven. We can only consider ourselves forgiven of our sins and saved if God has decreed so in His Word. God doesn't agree with us. We're to agree with Him. Salvation is on His terms and His terms alone. And my friend, the Lord could simply have not been any plainer in His Word about what we must do to be saved. You might say, well, if that's the case, why doesn't everybody see it that way? Why isn't the religious world united in preaching that and believing that and practicing that? Well, for the same reasons everybody doesn't see anything else about the Bible the same way. You see, human tradition, gradual departures from the truth down through time, the confusion the devil has purposefully and masterfully caused in religion has obscured what the Bible plainly and simply says about salvation and many other things. He doesn't want the world to be saved, and he's going to do everything he can to prevent people from being saved, and so he tries to get people to believe something that's not right. And friend, we can look at the divine record of how the Lord sent His apostles forth to fill the earth with the gospel message, and how men and women all over the world responded to that preaching. And that's what matters. It doesn't matter what Ulrich Zwingli said and argued 500 years ago. It doesn't matter what John Calvin and his many disciples say. And no, it doesn't matter what Alexander Campbell or any other man said about it. It doesn't matter what I say about it. It doesn't matter what Billy Graham has said about it or any other preacher, any other televangelist, any other great revivalist. It doesn't matter what any uninspired person has said. What matters is what did Christ and His apostles say and what they said matters. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And we didn't have time to delve into this today, but baptism by the very definition of the original word means an immersion, to be immersed in water in the likeness of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, Romans 6, 3-4, it is an immersion in water for in order to receive the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. And so now the question is, friend, is that what you believe? Is that what you did? How you did it and why you did it? It matters. It makes a difference how I'm saved because Christ is the author of our salvation.
Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. It's a privilege to come into your home and study the Bible with you through this medium, and I appreciate you for taking the time to do so. If you would like to have a free transcript of today's sermon so you can go back and read it again or study further, we would be glad to send it to you. As always, it is free of any cost or obligation whatsoever. We're happy to send it. Just get in touch with us and ask for the lesson. Does it make a difference how I'm saved? And we will get that to you as quickly as we can. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that you'll make plans to join me back here next week, if God is willing, for another time of Bible study and investigation together. In the meantime, you can keep in touch with us online, our website, ltbstv.org, and as well, our YouTube channel. Search for Let the Bible Speak TV and be sure to subscribe while you're there and help us out by sharing our content. Our content, we would surely appreciate it. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time, if God is willing. Until then, God bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.